Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge, and how much happier that man is who believes his native town to be the world, than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. Comprehending the actions and reactions of one Victor Frankenstein is one of the more arduous tasks when it comes to reading Mary Shelley's gothic classic. While he frequently insists he's not a madman, I'm not crazy! He spends years of his life researching occult secrets, stitching together body parts, and being kind of in love with his kind of sister. In movies and other pieces of media, Victor is regularly portrayed as a mad scientist with wild gray hair, a sort of Einstein from hell. But in reality, Victor is only in his early 20s when he is relaying his tale to Robert Walton on his ship. While he is physically mature, what we might call a legal adult in our society, Victor hasn't quite finished maturing mentally or emotionally. Despite his brilliant scientific mind, he's still sort of a man-child. I'm in the middle without still coming to terms with his own mortality and morality. Shelley herself, just 19 years old when she completed Frankenstein, was no stranger to her fair share of man-children. Just three years prior, she had a rambunctious affair with the esteemed romantic poet Percy Shelley, who was, at the time, four years her senior. After the early and unexpected passing of his wife, and against the wishes of her family, the two married. Shelley was also, like Victor, incredibly book smart. She was the child of a political philosopher and pioneering feminist writer, and was extremely well educated in the Western canon. That is, the classic literary works like Shakespeare, Homer, and the Bible, which high culture still today deems to be the core of Western tradition. From name-dropping occult philosophers to quoting at length the rhyme of the ancient mariner, Shelley makes sure to demonstrate her literary clout throughout the text. While these allusions demonstrate Victor and therefore Shelley's authority as intellectuals, they also provide us insight into some of the key thematic points in Frankenstein. Ones that are often overlooked in this discussion of science gone too far. For instance, the text opens with an important quote from John Milton's Paradise Lost. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? A sort of... Biblical fan fiction, Paradise Lost retells the story of Satan's fall from heaven and Eve's subsequent committing of the first sin in Eden, a highly influential text, particularly to someone like Shelley who would have been trained in the classics. Paradise Lost is one of the English tradition's most important epic poems. Like the Odyssey or the Iliad, an epic poem is a long story written in verse. It usually deals with humanity, fate, and supernatural forces. That is to say, as much as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is a forward-thinking, cautionary tale about the dangers of science and the irrational pursuit of power, it is also very much about the human condition. Like Eve, Victor experiences a sheltered, one might say Edenic youth, which eventually leads him to making a grave error out of prideful ignorance, or to use a term we've discussed earlier, out of hubris. The consequences of their actions bring not only doom and ruin to themselves, but also their entire family and potentially the entire human race. While most of us will not make such a grievous error in our lifetime, these texts can teach us the importance of moving past our mistakes as a youth in the pursuit of becoming a well-rounded, fully realized adult. An opportunity 
few of the characters in Frankenstein ever get to realize. Victor, a young man of extreme wealth and privilege, grew up in, as I said before, a veritable Eden. No human being could have passed a happier childhood than myself. My parents were possessed by the very spirit of kindness and indulgence. We felt that they were not tyrants to rule our lot according to their caprice, but the agents and creators of all the many delights which we enjoyed. In this prelapsarian state, he has everything he could wish for and lives in harmony with the natural world. He wants for nothing. Even the lightning, which later becomes aligned with the monster he creates, dazzles him with its power. As I stood at the door, on a sudden I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak which stood about twenty yards from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When we visited it the next morning, we found the tree shattered in a singular manner. It was not splintered by the shock, but entirely reduced to thin ribbons of wood. I never beheld any so utterly destroyed. However, even in these early happy days of childhood, he becomes obsessed with unnatural thoughts like glory and immortality. These thoughts, culturally, go against the preordained order of the natural world, or what those of faith might call God's plan. Under the guidance of my new preceptors, I entered with the greatest diligence into the search of the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life, but that latter soon obtained my undivided attention. Wealth was an inferior object, but what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death? In this way, he parallels Eve in Paradise Lost. In Paradise Lost, Eve questions the natural order of both man's dominion over woman and God's dominion over mankind that is imposed upon her from the moment of her creation. It is this questioning of the natural order that propels both characters to reach for forbidden fruit. Eve views the forbidden fruit both as an all-curing panacea and, through Satan's temptation, a way to become godlike herself. Here grows the cure of all, this fruit divine, fair to the eye, inviting to the taste, of virtue to make wise. What hinders then to reach and feed at once both body and mind? Why then was this forbid? Why but to awe? Why but to keep you low and ignorant, his worshippers? He knows that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes that seem so clear, yet are but dim, shall perfectly be then opened and cleared, and ye shall be as gods. Likewise, Victor sees his pursuits with the monster as a way to subvert the natural order. Not only will he eradicate the boundaries of life and death, but also elevate himself to become the god of a new race. Life and death appear to me ideal bounds, which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. Pursuing these reflections, I thought, that if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, I might, in process of time, renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. Tragedy befalls both of these characters once they attain the knowledge they both desperately and mindlessly pursued. Eve and her husband Adam, suddenly aware and ashamed of their nakedness, their place in the natural world, are banished from Eden, cursed to wander the world with the knowledge of their sin and their impending death. In the Bible in Paradise Lost, not only is Eve punished for her singular transgression against the natural order, she also casts ruin upon the entire human race. Mirroring this, like Eve, Victor finds himself suddenly aware of the shames of his actions and recoils. From the moment the monster is alive, Victor becomes disgusted both with the creature and himself. Beautiful, 
Great God. His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set. His shriveled complexion and straight black lips, the different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation. But now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. In an instant, he suddenly becomes aware of the crime he has committed against the natural order, and, out of shame, starts distancing himself from the natural world he once loved. Both the natural beauty of the world and natural philosophy become disgusting to him, causing him both physical and emotional torment. Ever since the fatal night, the end of my labors, and the beginning of my misfortunes, I had conceived a violent antipathy even to the name of natural philosophy. When I was otherwise quite restored to health, the sight of a chemical instrument would renew all the agony of my nervous symptoms. M. Waldman inflicted torture when he praised, with kindness and warmth, the astonishing progress I had made in the sciences. What could I do? He meant to please, and he tormented me. I felt as if he had placed carefully, one by one, in my view, those instruments which were to be afterwards used in putting me to a slow and cruel death. This is further exemplified in one of the most powerful scenes in the book. As he is walking home to visit Geneva upon hearing of the death of his little brother William, Victor happens upon a lightning storm, where he once found great inspiration and awe in the wonders of lightning. As we saw with the earlier quote, Victor now finds only terror and the realization that, in a successful pursuit to become godlike, he has brought about the ruin of an innocent and beloved child. The storm appeared to approach rapidly, and on landing I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced, the heavens were clouded, and I soon felt the rain coming slowly in large drops, but its violence quickly increased. Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. Then, for an instant, Everything seemed of a pitchy darkness until the eye recovered itself from the preceding flash. While I watched the tempest, so beautiful yet terrific, I wandered on with hasty step. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this is thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me, its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspect, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon, to whom I had given life. In addition to all of their other similarities, even Victor share another common feature. They are both, in many ways, despite having all the appearance of a fully facultied adult. Both children, Eve, when she makes her fatal error in Paradise Lost, has just come into being. A fully formed adult who is still playing the baby's game of recognizing her own face in the reflection in water. Victor, physically a man at the age of 22, has never dealt with the consequences of his own actions, if he ever acted poorly at all. Their environment... Their youthful Eden had sheltered them from the knowledge of good and evil. They discover, through their misdeeds, the good they had and the evil they had brought upon themselves. While there are certainly major moral takeaways from this text concerning artificial intelligence, the unchecked pursuit of science, and all of the other themes we are bombarded with, this text is also, like Eve's fall, at its heart a coming-of-age tale. Childhood ends, it seems, not at a certain age, but with certain knowledge. 
the knowledge that we are capable of good and evil, and the knowledge that each of us shall perish. Be it so, for I submit, his doom is fair, that dust I am, and shall to dust return. For psychologist and philosopher Carl Jung, these two bits of knowledge are at the heart of the process of individuation, or rather, the process of psychic maturity. His theory, in a way, is that in the same way our body matures, so too does the mind in an effort to become a complete individual. Understanding our guilt is one of the most important processes of individuation. The first step in individuation is tragic guilt. This accumulation of guilt demands expiation. When we are conscious of our guilt, we are in a more favorable position. We can at least hope to change and improve ourselves. And I think this is the real tragedy of Frankenstein. None of the characters are able to complete the process of individuation by coming to terms with their own guilt or their own mortality. Both Victor and the monster continually choose wrath and revenge, the opposites of forgiveness and acceptance, over understanding the misdeeds of each other. This leads directly and indirectly to numerous untimely deaths of innocent people who die as a consequence of this blood feud between a father and a son. Thus, the most important thing we can learn from Victor. We will certainly err in our lives. It is not our errors, or what some call our sins, that define us, but how we choose to move on. Do we decide to forgive and accept ourselves and become the best version of ourselves? Or do we choose the path of monstrosity? 